I'm Lakshmi Fjord, Chair of the Charlottesville People's Tribunal. We are so honored to come before you today to present some of the places and persons whose testimonies you received in full from our October 28th, 2017 Charlottesville Tribunal. These few representative testimonies speak for the thousands of people in West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina who now face two huge new frac gas infrastructure projects. The Atlantic, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, or ACP, and the Mountain Valley Pipeline, or MVP. Because of their route choices, these most impacted peoples will never themselves receive a single kilowatt of electricity or gas from these projects. For over four years after the first shock until today, we collectively have learned one certainty. Frack gas first fractures rock, then fractures people from their land by eminent domain, communities from their present clean air, water, and soil, and counties and states along pre-existing social injustice fault lines. Both ACP and MVP disproportionately target people in places that are majority rural, low income, and majority African American, Native American, and coal, now frac gas country, Appalachians. These we identify as the four environmental justice communities whose very existence, their towns and demographics were erased in ACP and MVP application documents yet they are targeted to pay the true cost of these two pipelines, if constructed. Their hard-earned investments are in communities targeted by ACP and MVP to bear the heaviest per community environmental burdens of toxic hazards to health, water, air, present jobs and economies, losses of property value, and even their insurance. David Sly of the conservation group Wild Virginia, and whose family have lived in this early colonized place since the early 1700s, testified saying, the pipeline companies want to cross through thousands of streams and wetlands and to disrupt the eco ecological health of watersheds. Cumulative impacts will affect major river basins, including the Shenandoah and Potomac rivers, the James River and the Roanoke River. Many highly sensitive water bodies will be affected, ranging from mountain trout streams to habitats for endangered and threatened species to unique wetland communities. And construction is proposed to occur in some of the most challenging environments in the United States. The route through which the western portion of Virginia would cross many areas with very steep slopes, highly erodible soils, and records of frequent landslides. Most construction companies, which routinely expect to abide by runoff control requirements, would never propose to build in these types of environments because the standard measures simply will not protect water quality and they know it. The destruction of forests and native plants and the excavation of huge trenches for the pipelines would result in the discharge of thousands of tons of sediments and other pollutants into our waters. By digging, cutting, even blasting through stream bottoms, the companies would release more pollution and would also fundamentally alter the physical features and vital habitats in these waters. State agency scientists have stated that the natural functions of those ecosystems could be eliminated. On this map are marked the huge areas of U.S. National Forest public lands held in trust for the American people's well-being, where the U.S. Forest Service approved the ACP and MVP projects to be routed. After the presidential election, a once critical Forest Service has since given MVP and ACP rights to vary away from long-held restrictions on harms to soil, water, riparian, old growth, and recreation and visual resources. Dana Christophilus writes, over its 300-mile length, MVP would cut through almost 250 miles of forested land, or over 80% of its total route, including an old growth forest in Jefferson National Forest, end quote. The ACP route is through the George Washington and Monongahela National Forests. These exemplify violations of the rights of nature 
that will impact complex, diverse ecosystems that provide most needed equilibrium against greater climate change. The ACP estimates their climate change contribution to be 67 million 591 816 metric tons per year. That is the emissions equivalent of 20 coal-fired energy plants or 14 million passenger vehicles. If built, both will horizontal drill under the Appalachian Trail, part of the Natural Park Service. Um, the Old Dominion Trail Club warns the release of chemicals into the frac bedrock geology and the water resources of the Blue Ridge Mountains could be devastating to the natural communities and severely impede the recreational use of the AT and its surrounding public lands. In a staggering breach of human rights, the Forest Service and Virginia State Police in the Jefferson National Forest are currently denying food, water, and medical care to tree sitter protesters against those predations by the MVP. All this loss, and not even Cheryl LaFleur, the senior most Federal Energy Regulatory Commissioner, or FERC, finds either pipeline is needed, nor do they, in her words, serve the public interest. On October 13, 2017, FERC approved both the ACP and MVP in a very rare two-to-one vote. LaFleur dissented, and these are her main points that are on the screen. They're both very similar. They take their gas from the same source, their markets are the same, and their routes are almost parallel in some places. She's saying we are, you know, we don't need 900 miles of new frac gas infrastructure that has significant impacts, cars, thousands of water bodies. Um, it's going to impact a lot of significant cultural resources, as mentioned earlier, and there's absolutely no demonstrated need other than ACP uh, for its own uh, subsidiaries. Um, from Tom Hadwin, we, who's the former gas and oil industry executive, has done extensive research. And in his testimony, we learned that this rush to build pipelines is entirely a result of FERC's decision to pay 50% higher rates of return for new gas transmission lines than to do utility infrastructure building, which would be renewables. The last thing about this context is in FERC's own first quarter report for 2018, they noted that only 3% of new electrical generation was from gas and 94% from renew renewables. This ought to make us very glad, but not when the fracking boom has not yet busted because of the higher returns from exporting to foreign markets. It's the tragedy of the last soldier killed after the peace was called, but before the looting stopped. The Charlottesville People's Tribunal was a direct response to witnessing Virginia State Police in riot gear standing by and doing nothing to protect people of color, being savagely beaten before our eyes, killed as we chanted for equality on August 11 and 12, 2017. The hostility of the police to the nonviolent protesters felt akin, though not at the same scale, to the hostility expressed at public meetings if critiquing these projects by boards of supervisors, by FERC staff at hearings, by the Water Control Board, by Virginia's then governor, a great ally of Dominion Energy, largest campaign donor in this Virginia, and the principal stakeholder of the ACP. That is why many of our testimonies from across both pipelines are of betrayal by local elected representatives, by state agencies, governors, charged with protecting all citizens, but instead replicating centuries-long social injustices and disparity. Last night, we learned that it's the rights of nature that has chiseled into ACP seemingly rock-solid forward progress, and we hope that MVP's lawyers will take up this strategy. Based on the Endangered Species Act, the Four Cir Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals did not accept an incidental take statement, which is the deaths allowed for Dominion by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency of threatened and endangered species while building the ACP. Therefore, the Forest Service and Corps of Engineers must halt all the ground pipeline activities under these permits until the defects of that plan has been remedied. In response, however, Dominion vowed 
to continue to press forward with construction on the pro project, according to Robert Zullo of the Richmond Times Dispatch. Thank you. Hello, I'm Irene Leach, and I am going to be talking about the rural communities and the public participation. Uh, so I'll share my screen and start the PowerPoint. I'm going to introduce you to some of the people. This is uh, Cletus and Beverly Bohan's property, uh, and it's split by the pipeline. Uh, and they've been told that they can access the half of their property that's not uh, available uh, once they, uh, the workers are not there. Don Apgar uh, is in his 80s and the water of the North Fork of the Roanoke River is an important piece for him in terms of recreation uh, as well as the family heritage. Bill and Lynn Limpert live in Bath County and their retirement home uh, is threatened by this. They're standing by Ona, uh, who is a three to 400 year old sugar maple tree uh, in an old growth forest. Uh, and approximately 10, somewhere between 10 and 60 feet of this mountain are going to be removed in order to make a space wide enough for the pipeline. This is my own family farm, uh, 1,200 acres that we have in the geographic center of Virginia and that we have farmed with registered Ang Angus cattle for 116 years. What you're looking at right now are the terraces that my grandfather built uh, 50 or more years ago to make the water uh, stay on the land instead of running off. Uh, Dominion insists that for ACP, they have to go straight through these, while if they would do as we have asked within our quantity of land to move to the edges of the fields that they're going through, uh, they could avoid damaging this. So you, you see that there are all kinds of issues, rural communities uh, are being hit. Uh, nobody wants to invest in them to give us the internet and things that other people have. Um, they, many of the people say that, well, we should just leave these communities and go other places. They don't understand that they need the trees and the soil to have the clean air uh, and the water that they all count on. There are a number of ways that there have been challenges to uh, people participating in the process. Uh, FERC, the federal government agency that's responsible for all of this, is very closely tied uh, to the industry. Uh, and for example, even if they require that they uh, do some inspections, the pipeline companies hire the inspectors uh, and supervise them. Uh, they'll do things uh, and allow things to happen so that they can ignore uh, the information. And so the landowner or consumer uh, is not listened to, even though in the 1930 legislation for the agency, uh, it required uh, that they have a landowner or consumer office. And we've tried several times, but uh, they, they just won't allow it to happen. Internet access is critical to participate in the process uh, because that's how you submit things to FERC. You could not mail them, but um, the way that you really get up-to-date information is on the internet. And many of these rural communities don't have uh, decent internet service. Uh, we have less than some third world countries uh, in our rural areas. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, people depend on the FERC website, but uh, it's not dependable. And so uh, it's, it's a real challenge to, to make things uh, happen the way that we need for uh, them to. Public information has been limited and focused on PR, not facts uh, that don't have spin connected with them. And they've focused on uh, the information that the company wants to get out there. 
uh, it's been very frustrating because the meetings have been arranged in ways that make it very hard for people to participate uh, in them. For example, not in the affected county, uh, requiring that people drive distances at night. Uh, and many of the people affected are elderly. Uh, or they'll have meetings during working hours when working people cannot get there. Um, they're set up in ways that are intimidating to people uh, and the agency people who have moderated in uh, several cases have been uh, threatening to people, threatening that if they didn't stop standing against the, the wall that they're going to close the hearing. Uh, they've also done things like require that when people come in the door they say whether they are for or against. Um, the, pro the project and then arranging things uh, that way. Or they have also gotten so that now they don't want people to speak at the podium and they will require that people go to a private room somewhere uh, to say what they're going to say. And that means that the other people cannot hear what they say, the press cannot hear what they say, uh, and so you have uh, this lack of a record. Uh, we've also seen that the transcriptions that have shown up on the FERC website are often very poor uh, and totally fail to get the message that the individuals are trying to put across. So uh, this is, has been a major problem uh, all through this process. Uh, you've already heard that there's been no real evaluation of the need for the infrastructure and, and that's a big problem because uh, they claim that they've got growing needs and uh, increased demand when in reality uh, it's decreasing and we have no known use for the energy that they're trying to move. They're taking our land, they're making us live with it and with the stress and the risk uh, and there's no verified uh, need and in fact what we suspect is that it will be sold for private profit. The decisions that are made are made using incomplete and inaccurate information partly because of the way the system is set up so that different information gets submitted to the federal agency at different times as well as to other agencies and they're forced to make decisions and we're forced to respond to things uh, when the information isn't all in place. Uh, we've also had problems with them ignoring the facts that we've presented even when we've told them that the information that they're using is wrong um, and they'll manipulate the data uh, in their favor. For example, Lachmi has proved that there are many more people living in the Union Hill area than the county level data that the uh, industry has used. And when she asked just last week if they would fix that, the answer was no. Um, and they'll do things uh, like tell neighbors that people have uh, accepted an easement when they haven't. Uh, and this information issue goes all the way through this. Uh, the procedures are not easily discovered or understood. Uh, for example, you would have to sign up as an intervener in the very beginning of the case or you're not a allowed to later. You can't challenge the decision and uh, they've been denying uh, letting people be a part of that. They only notify the people who are directly uh, involved, not the people who are affected uh, but whose property is not going to have infrastructure on it, even if it's right next to it and their property is, is going to have danger uh, and, and so forth as a part of that. Um, and there are no rules that tell you when things uh, have to be done, when the company can say that they won't make any adjustments and, and so forth. Um, there even local government and state historical associations have been stymied in they're trying to be a part of things. This use of eminent domain is a major problem uh, because the industry uses it from the very beginning to intimidate the landowners. Um, the industry has no reason to work with the landowners uh, and uh, housing is and land are you know that's the single largest asset that most people have 
Uh, and so the fact that they could take this and that they could reduce the value of it uh, really puts some families in economic jeopardy. Uh, and it's, it's not fair to be doing this when it's something that uh, isn't going to be for public benefit. The easements give the people a one-time payment, um, not ongoing income for ongoing use of their land. And that landowner continues to pay property taxes while their use of the land is permanently changed. Um, there's great pressure to accept an easement early in the process, which then the federal agency takes as people being willing to do it. And yet, uh, when you wait to do it, uh, then they will not move the pipeline uh, on your property. That's a part of what I'm dealing with with my family. There's disruption of homes and businesses. Uh, for example, there's a couple in Newport, Virginia along the MVP who had the pipeline on one side of their acre and a half lot uh, and an access road on the other side. They've In their 80s, they've been forced to move. Um, for my family business, we have found that, you know, they don't understand the needs of making our business continue on the land that we own uh, as they do what they're going to do. Uh, they just say, well, we'll show up when we show up and, you know, we'll pay you for anything that uh, you lose as a result of that. We need time to plan for our 400 cattle and for how we're going to get done the things that we need to do. Um, but as far as they're concerned, our business doesn't matter and that disruption uh, doesn't matter. States are ha having to fight in court uh, in order to have the opportunity to be a part of the decision-making process. New York has pushed the envelope. Our state of Virginia uh, and West Virginia and North Carolina, none of them have wanted to, to press that. Uh, in fact, we have a hard time getting them to do the things that they need to do uh, and that we know that they have the authority to do. And we've been told um, your air and water are so clean you can afford this additional pop, uh, pollution. Uh, they really have, um, they don't think anything of taking away from us the things that rural people have moved to our area for uh, and they Clear, having the attitude that we don't deserve to have this clean air and that they have a right to take it from us. And finally, the safety standards are based on the industry risk, not the risk of the people who are affected. And there's a lower level of safety provided to people in rural areas, thinner pipe, 20 miles between cutoff valves, and all the gas has to burn off. Uh, in order to get it to stop. Uh, and so for even with as much property as my family has, all of our buildings are currently within the incineration zone and all of our property is within the evacuation zone or the fire zone. Uh, and so the risk that they are exposing people to uh, are unreasonable uh, and uh, are, are something that um, we really uh, need to do something uh, about. So uh, I will turn this over to our next speaker, who is April. So I'm April Pearson Keating from Buchanan, West Virginia. I'm with the Mountain Lakes Preservation Alliance, and I'm going to try to give you um, the background of West Virginia's part in this. We're Appalachian, we're the only state that's completely surrounded by Appalachia. Um, all of our areas are contained within the Appalachian region and many of our people are very poor. We have the second greatest biodiversity in the world after the Amazon rainforest and we're home to the headwaters of eight major rivers, several endangered species, and we've been ravaged by industry since before we became a state. Uh, logging began in the early part of the century, um, the, 18th, the, the 19th century. As you can see, they took a lot of old growth uh, trees out, but uh, they took most of them, but some are still left. The railroads came and the landmen started uh, 
conning people and cheating people out of their land and mineral rights and getting them to agree to sell them for very cheap. And that tradition continues today. Coal mining was a staple industry, always has been here. Um, it's starting to die out now because the reserves are going down. But um, as it has become mechanized, there's been losses of jobs. Um, and that's just the way the industry goes. In the 1970s, mountaintop removal mining started in earnest and started destroying the valleys even worse. What happens is when they blow the tops off the mountains and they get down into the rock, they get into um, the heavy metals, the arsenic, the cadmium, the copper, and they take all that dust and they throw it down in the valley. And you can see from the picture that the valleys contain little streams and, and rivers. So that's what happens to our water is it, it has become contaminated uh, has been contaminated by the industry. Our governor is a coal baron. Um, he ran for governor as a Democrat, but he was a Republican before that. And people might remember uh, soon after he was elected, he switched back. Uh, he put a mine by a Head Start preschool. He had 23,000 water pollution violations. And he, uh, that's the Clean Water Act violations and unpaid fines and taxes. So that's, that's our leadership. Uh, oil and gas began mid 1800s. Um, back then, in order to drill a well, you had a horse and cart going in a circle for several days before you would get down to the bottom. Uh, and those wells were shallow. Um, now we have wells that take up 25 acres and go 7,000 or more feet down and, and take tons of water and chemicals to do the job. So the industry isn't what it used to be. It uses millions of gallons of water every time a well is fracked. It creates a huge waste stream and that waste has to be put somewhere. We know the pipelines are going to expand fracking. Uh, there are 300 permits currently waiting to be developed in both Upshur County where I'm from and Lewis County, a neighboring county. And there are many more large pipeline projects proposed for the state or uh, already approved that are not on this map. We also have thousands of miles of pipeline in the ground. Uh, meanwhile, the old infrastructure isn't being taken care of. Um, you know, a, a rural place like Doddridge County that has beautiful places and old growth forest is crisscrossed by pipelines and full of gas infrastructure, as you see in the picture on the right. The picture on the left is from a, a visit from Princeton University uh, researchers who came uh, and did some research on gas emissions in West Virginia, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And they said they had never seen anything this bad as what we had in West Virginia. And I know personally, as we were driving through Doddridge County, sometimes it, it was very thick and you couldn't really breathe very well. Um, so the air quality is a problem, not only from the leaking infrastructure, but the large trucks and equipment and the compressor stations. Uh, Michael McCauley from WVU has been studying air quality and has pointed to the diesel emissions as being very, very hazardous and of course, this kind of development requires a lot of, of diesel equipment. West Virginia water is wonderful. We have the best water anywhere, um, or we did, and it feeds 40 st 14 states and 46 rivers. The picture on the right is what happened after the Stonewall Momentum Pipeline, that's a 36 inch pipeline went in uh, to one of the streams that we were monitoring. And here's some more of the effects. Um, you can see in uh, the top left and the bottom right photos, that is bentonite clay that came up into the stream bed after they drilled underneath the stream. The top right photograph is siltation after a rain, which happens in horrendous amounts um, once they tear off the trees and grass and create mud. And then the bottom left picture is just a, a coal mining holding pond for the acid mine drainage water before they treat it. 
but we do have um, acid mine drainage in the streams in several places. A lot of this construction is cr crossing wetlands and they are not, as you can see in this picture on the right, they're not controlling the runoff that goes into that little stream down there and this is happening everywhere. There's, the industry has been intimidating our people uh, from the beginning. Um, these pipes have been sitting out here since May 2016. They've been here too long. Uh, but since they're here, people just figure that the pipeline is definitely going through and they don't want to fight it. They don't see any reason to. Uh, even our county commission wrote a letter of approval for the stormwater permit on the ACP without reading it first. The trucks that carry the waste um, are not regulated because of the Halliburton loophole. Uh, the brine itself, the salt water that comes out of the earth is 10 times as salty as seawater. It'll kill anything it touches. Uh, and there are terrible chemicals and radiation that uh, are in this water and they're using it to de-ice the roads. Of course, there's a danger of leaks, fires, and explosions. And this is just a picture of a, an explosion that happened a few months ago in Ohio and that fire took a couple of weeks to put out. The McLean family, this is a heart-rending story. They've got a beautiful farm that they've had in their family for 70 years. Um, and they have had a lot of trouble from the gas industry development in Doddridge County. As you can see, their homestead is surrounded by three giant pipelines. The purple and the blue are the MVP and the Stonewall line, and you can see they are crossing each other, which I think is absolute insanity. And then about a mile away from them on the other side is the supply header project from the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. They they have been worried that the water might get into their house because the pipeline construction from the MVP is up on the ridge above them and it's very, very steep. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. A lot of these slopes are over 50% and the, the Middle Island Creek is the longest creek in the world. This is the water that feeds Doddridge County and it contains um, mussels, freshwater mussels that are endangered. This is from a letter that they wrote. Um, to Senators Manchin and Capito and got no response. The land agent stated they would use our road and it was their right to use it. He did not care about the damage that occurred to the fences and road banks, ditches, etc. As of today, no one has talked to us about this pipeline project. They have sent countless people on our land to survey and plan the destruction of our land without talking with us. I have lived here almost 70 years. I know which direction the water flows and where erosion and damage to the land will happen. These people do not care about the land, water, trees, or the lives of people living near these pipelines. When the Stonewall line went in um, three years ago, it's a 36 inch. Um, it crossed Middle Island Creek and various wetlands as well. Um, it was constructed by Precision, which is doing the MVP they were almost shut down. They were flatlanders. They were from Wisconsin and they didn't know how to do construction on these steep hills. Uh, and then the company, another company added the Morgan compressor station to that pipeline and they do regular blowdowns, which are very noisy and very disturbing to the people in the area. I went up on the ridge to see the construction a few days ago and it is absolutely horrible, um, I would say breathtaking, but <clears throat> that sounds positive. Um, <clears throat> the picture on the left shows this 125 foot wide swath that they've cleared. And the picture on the right is looking down only about halfway up to this ridge, um, looking down at their, their farmstead and the potential for the runoff into their, onto their land and into their home. Here's some more pictures. <clears throat> this is enormous. These pictures cannot possibly do it justice. The one on the right shows the valley below and the houses. And of course there are streams down there that are gonna be affected by all of this dirt as it gets wet in the rain. In this one, the picture on the left shows a silt fence that's supposed to protect the, keep the runoff from going downhill, but in a major rain and that's not going to do anything. 
um, they're gonna, they've cut the trees and piled them, they're gonna burn them. And there is a beer can in the ground there where they've just tossed it. The picture on the lower right, that is a spill kit. I have no idea what they think they can clean up with that. It's a joke. Uh, Doddridge County has been dealing with huge infrastructure and they just had completed this Antero, what they call clear water facility, but it's a frack waste processing place. Um, they're gonna be taking 600, that's an average, 600 trucks per day of frack waste containing radium-226. Um, they're going to be producing a trillion tons of toxic salt over the 20 years that they intend to operate. And they think they're going to use this for food and salt de-icing on the roads. Um, this is upstream of the water source for two towns, and they think they're going to protect the water. Another aspect of this industry is the damage to the roads and the dangers People are regularly killed when these trucks turn over and topple and fall on top of cars and kill families, children, and um, an accident just happened a few days ago out on Route 50 near Clarksburg, West Virginia. They tout jobs. They tell us it's going to be great, um, but we took some pictures of the different parking areas and these license plates are almost 100% out of state. The fleet at the bottom is a, a new fleet, a bunch of trucks that were just brought in. And the ones at the top, that's from back when they were doing the Stonewall pipeline. And we saw trucks from Wisconsin, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, all kinds of other places, but very few West Virginia license plates. This just continues the boom and bust economy and the workers are exposed to things and, and not even told what they're exposed to. Kevin Campbell used to work uh, on, on the rigs and he drove trucks, um, you know, carrying pipe and different um, pumps and supplies. And, um, you know, they abuse these workers. They make them work over 40 hours. They don't let them sleep. Um, they tell them to falsify the documents. And he, he tells this horrible story of when they were pouring concrete down for a casing and it just kept on going and they didn't know where it was going and they just kept on pumping it for 30 hours straight. He later worked as an EMT where he transported people that were sickened by their water wells that had been poisoned by frack waste. The Binion family has been through it. They had um, a dehydrator in Taylor County, although the picture is from a sh the Sherwood processing plant in Doddridge County but that's where they live now. But um, they had heart problems. The, the kids in the neighborhood had nosebleeds and various other health problems. Um, the, the EPA and the DEP just wouldn't do anything. The DEP didn't even have equipment to test the air to see what was in it or how much was in it. This is one landowner who's surrounded by both ACP and MVP in Lewis County. Um, Upshur County, this is where I live. This is our high school. Um, the pipeline is 2,200 feet from the county's only high school. The class two pipe is the second thinnest type of pipe that they are required or allowed to put in. There are four thicknesses um, and they don't apparently think that we're worth the thickest pipe. Um, this also, if it would blow in this area, it would, it would cover up Route 20, which is our main north-south artery in the county, and emergency vehicles would not be able to get to the school to rescue anyone. This is a construction yard that's been built and they're currently working at, and I just wanted to show you that there's water all around this. And when you look at the plans uh, in the permits, almost all of these yards are surrounded by water. Selbyville has an injection well uh, that went in five years ago. We went canvassing out there to let them know about a public hearing that they didn't know about. And we talked to people who had lost their water when the well first went in. So the injection of the waste um, has created seismic activity. If you look over on the right side of your screen at Braxton County, 
where the yellow dot is a Marcellus injection well and the um, orange circles are so on the right side of the screen you can see that the injection well there and um, a bunch of earthquakes that occurred in 2010 and 2013 that were attributed to that injection well. West Virginia shouldn't be having any kind of seismic activity. Also, there's been um, widespread water contamination in Fayette County at the Lock Gelly uh, well um, pond, sludge pond that's been leaking out into that community's water and they cannot use their water anymore. And of course, our sludge and waste, a lot of it has been going to Youngstown, Ohio, which has been experiencing a lot of earthquakes related to that injection. <clears throat> Griesinger's had a beautiful farm out on Holly Grove Road and after Chesapeake drilled a uh, Marcellus well, they lost their water and so did the neighbors. Sometimes the underground injection or the, not the injection, well the injection can, but the fracking can shake the ground and create fissures and cracks where the water then from the aquifer will leak out and just dry up and that's what happened to their well. Now Wetzel County is the origin of the Mountain Valley Pipeline and Mobley, West Virginia has basically been completely taken over by EQT and Mark West. You see the picture on the top there with the red circle. Now that's the Mark West facility that is blown up there at the bottom, that bottom picture. Um, there's also an EQT compressor, I'm sorry, EQT uh, well pad with 17 wells on it. And the blue squares are where homes used to be. Uh, those homes have been purchased and raised. So this area is completely owned and controlled by oil and gas. Monroe County is, is right next to, um, I believe it's Giles in Virginia, and they've been fighting very valiantly against the MVP. They've had tree sits. Um, that have been actually very successful, in my opinion, at delaying things long enough for the courts to consider what's really going on. And they were denied food and water by the Forest Service of all organizations. Um, and one of the problems is that there was an earthquake in September 2017, only a mile and a half away from the MVP route. Um, in May of that year, there was one six miles away. So, um, you know, when you're putting a pipeline in the ground, these pipes are 40 in 40 foot sections. And that means that there's 135 welds per mile. So that's 135 chances per mile for something to go wrong if the earth should move. Next thing that is going to be coming along is this Appalachian storage hub because Louisiana and Houston are no longer viable and everything starts up here anyway. This is where most of the gas and the natural gas liquids are sourced. What they're going to be doing is um, this project is only in the conceptual stages, but you might have heard about the $83.7 billion deal with China. They're going to be investing in this project. Our governors are behind it. Our commerce secretary and WVU, our major university, are all behind this project. They would be injecting natural gas liquids into abandoned salt caverns, which are the red circles, and some abandoned underground gas wells and possibly potentially mines um, in these areas. And then they're going to run six pipelines adjacent to the Ohio River and um, expect nothing to go wrong. These caverns will be full of um, LNG, natural, or NGLs, natural gas liquids, and they will be stored in there several different types by density in the same cavern. So here's some resources. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I invite anyone to reach out to me for more information, look these up on the internet, find your own local organizations. Um, but there's a lot of people working on this right now and I encourage everyone to get involved because our water is our future and without it, we won't survive. 
Hi, I'm Lakshmi Fjord, and here I'm the historian and demographer of Union Hill. Um, after the violent and racist events in Charlottesville in August, Virginians ask ourselves, uh, where do we stand on the racist heritage of Virginia? I'm gonna discuss a little bit about um, the African-American um, impacts of the, Atlant of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. We're asking how and where does racism manifest itself and uh, in present day social systems and institutions. So in our People's Tribunal, one of the questions we asked was, what direct relationship is there between the extremist racist violence that was perpetrated in the name of preserving Virginia's heritage and Civil War monuments and the, real, the slow violence of locating the Atlantic Coast Pipeline's only enormous, highly toxic polluting Virginia compressor station in an 85% African-American and historic Freedman community of Union Hill. So what are the cost benefits specifically of racism and environmental injustice more broadly? Yesterday, I was sent from um, uh, allies in North Carolina communities um, a press release that they filed a complaint mm -hmm. with the EPA with their Civil Rights Compliance Office because they say that the federal and state agencies have discriminated on the basis of race and color because they failed to assess the disproportionate impacts of the ACP on communities of color, which is required under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So they're calling them out. They're saying that they, you know, they haven't done any of the basic environmental assessments, and they are also along places where they are already experiencing a lot of the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. Belinda Joyner, who's the president of Concerned Citizens of Northampton County in North Carolina where the ACP plans to build its only North Carolina mega compressor station said, the ACP pipeline will benefit us in no shape, form, or fashion. The economic development types don't mind harming us, but if a pipeline were planned close to their homes, they'd say it would bring their property value down. Well, for people of color in sacrifice zones, not only will it bring our property value down, it will kill us at the same time. But do they care? And she is entirely right. Compressor stations, even one seventh the size of the ones planned by the ACP, one for each state, do commonly cause respiratory issues that occur in higher proportions in African Americans already because of higher rates of continuous exposures to sources of toxic emissions. Tessa Maruso testified on behalf of the people of Norfolk and Tidewater, Virginia on our Atlantic coast, whose water supply is threatened by the aptly named Atlantic Coast Pipeline. She notes that these are places already invulnerable to the devastating effects of climate change and sea level rise. This is where ACP is gonna, wants to run their connector link through reservoirs in, right by reservoirs in Suffolk County, Virginia and underground in three urban majority African-American neighborhoods. So what we're bringing to light is this long-term unrelenting pattern of discriminatory infrastructure building in minority and low income communities. And this is what led to the creation of the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. But Dominion has consistently engaged in the use of misinformation about demographics for these high impact sites where it just so happens African Americans are the majority. These strategic omissions have served ACP well by providing enormous cost benefits. Erasing population numbers allows for the rural classifications that people have talked about, which cost the developers less. Erasing population turns the regulatory eyes away from Union Hill's massive concentration of toxic polluting infrastructure, which is a deviation from actual gas industry standards where to build even a small compressor station, they say it should be in truly sparsely populated places and not near highly traveled roads. Well, none of those are true 
for Union Hill. These omissions actually don't allow decision makers to make informed decisions like FERC or the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, even our local, our state officials and the public. Dominion's ratepayers don't know that increases in their utility rates are to pay for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And so it'll be higher cost to their wallets, but they're also perpetrating environmental racism and climate change. So Buckingham's over 125 year recorded history of frequent, like four times a year earthquakes, is but one of the total absences of key information that ACP had in their application and FERC in their final environmental impact study, even though many of us made uh, comments to correct that information as Irene spoke about. And completely missing was Union Hill's history and the demographics and the um, topographies, the soil characteristics, the migratory species and habitats, and proximity to single source aquifers. But all that stands in really sharp contrast to the counties that are next to Buckingham where ACP filed hundreds of pages of historic cultural resources. So to correct that record, I undertook uh, a NEPA-esque community study review and at the same time, I uncovered, you know, uh, not that well hidden, 150 year history of the cost benefits of erasing Union Hill slave and freedmen past. On February 26, 1869, the day the U.S. House of Representatives passed the 15th Amendment giving former slaves the right to vote, vigilantes burnt down the Buckingham Courthouse. From news articles of the day, I learned that former slaveholders feared that the wills with names of inherited slaves or records of slaves purchasing freedmen from certain owners would be used by the then two to one former slave majority to sue for restitution. These are some of the um, things that we have found that are on the ground, and these are some of the freedmen families and their locations. If you can see in my cursor works, there's a yellow band coming through that says compressor station and clustered on all these sides are these um, African-American families. Um, here is the numbers, incredible numbers of people that we found when we went on a door-to-door -door household study. Um, our teams filled in those vital statistics that were missing from any, um, from the absent NEPA review. We found out about family history. We found some pretty shocking and concerning pre-existing chronic health, con health conditions. And these are places in which, if you can see in the middle that yellow triangle, that's the compressor station complex, but these are clusters of 99 houses that are very close by, between 150 feet to one mile. Um, we found out that, but in, put this all together and we were eligible to apply for the most endangered historic place in Virginia um, for this Union Hill Woods Corner District. We learned that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline had purchased that 68 acre site in secrecy from white descendants of former variety shade plantation owners. Recorded in the public record were their payments of $37,000 an acre to the white plantation family. Were surrounded on every side were these 99 households of majority African Americans, one third of whom are known freedmen descendants of ancestors enslaved nearby whose heritage land is meant to be passed along to future generations and has lost a lot of its value and they may even lose insurance coverage. Um, going door to door, um, we found that as um, Irene mentioned, that the misinformation that Dominion used was the average census data for the whole county, which is 29.6 people per square mile which is just a figure, but then if you look at this, this is a square mile, and we had 500% more people living there than Dominion would admit. Um, 
it's a suburban level of um, habitation. And of that habitation, 85% as, uh, identify as African American. We've had Union Hills residents skew in this study toward the very old and the very young. There's been a, two generations of outmigration of young adults to more equal opportunity ur urban places. And that's led to their leaving with their parents and grandparents a very large number of very young, I mean, zero to six age children who have respiratory illnesses. And as was mentioned, because of the present clean air and peaceful environment, says Marie Gillespie, um, her granddaughter has this, these chronic illnesses, this chronic respiratory illness, and she's deeply concerned that she will then become exposed to these things, um, to the um, toxins in the air. Um, the slave burials that were originally notated as part of the um, <coughs> variety shade plantation are hundreds laid out in rows and it's really very hard to see and imagine what it's like to see these row after row after <coughs> uniform row of sunken uh, graves in the ground where just these two um, concrete handmade markers were placed but with the archaeologists of Preservation Virginia, you can come to see exactly where these slave burials are. And they're also marked with, you can't really see it that well, but there's some green under that fall foliage. And that is periwinkle. And it turns out that this is one of the things in Virginia that archaeologists look for when um, trying to find slave burial sites that they've been told about. Um, in particular, variety shades, long uniform rows of unmarked burials are where we now know that Berkeley and John Wesley Lorry's ancestors lie. So I'm introducing you to um, John Lorry and wife Ruby's farm on Union Hill Road. My name is John W. Lorry. Can you step back a little? Just so you can't see it, please. There we go, perfect. <laughs> I grew up on my grandfather's farm. His name was Asbury Larry, and his grandmother's name was Anna Larry. And my father's name was Will Larry, and my mother's name was Mamie Larry. And far as I know, the farm was in their name, goes back to the 1800s. And I've been in, I grew up in the Union Hill, Union Grove community, and I had an enjoyable upbringing. And we all learned to live off the land. We was all farmers. We raised our own fruit and farm, we grew the vegetables, raised the meats that we used, and we also attended our local school, Union Grove Elementary School, and from there we went, I went to SULS Elementary, SULS Middle School and College of Wilson High School, where I graduated from. After that, I joined the Air Force, spent four years discharged at Norton Air Force Base, and from there, I remained in Southern California. After 35 years there, returned, relocated in 2003 to Buckingham, at which time I had decided I wanted to farm myself and raise cattle. All went well till 2014. I was informed that our board of supervisors and county officials had decided that they were going to allow Dominion ACP to have a special use permit. Uh, 
available for Dominion to build a proposed compressor station in our community. And that was bad news because that meant that in our cattle raising and our farming and also in our golden years, that was disaster for our community. So our main concern then went from clean air to what we felt was definitely poisonous gas, underground water contamination. And these are still our major concern even today. We have to depend on our underground water source for all in our entire community, as well as for our animals. And without our water, clean water, we cannot survive. So we have been fighting this monster since 2014 and we intend to continue to fight it because we want to continue breathing this clean air and drinking this clean underground water. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ruby Laurie, and I will be speaking on the effect of noise on performance, stress, and behavior of animals. I'm originally from Southern California. I moved here almost 15 years ago with my husband. After moving here, I understood why he wanted to come back home. Buckingham is a beautiful place and one of the most quiet and peaceful, no pollution, lots of clean air, no stress. My husband's avocation is raising cattle. He is an animal lover, you name it, cattle, donkeys, sheep, dogs, deer, etc. So my concerns are the effect noise will have on our cattle, especially the newborn calves and our donkey. The other concern are these dangerous chemicals that will be released into the air and that our cattle will have to breathe, as well as the effect these gases will have on our groundwater for our animals. So it has been proven that cattle hear high frequency sounds much better than humans. Can you imagine the stress, the performance, and the behavior this noise will have on our cattle as well as the newborn calves in our, as well as the newborn calves on a continual basis. Can you imagine the trauma this noise will have when the mother cow is trying to give birth? This is one of the reasons why I, I am so adamant about this proposed pipeline and compressor station. It only is not fair to the animals, but it is also not fair to the humans. Needless to say, our property values will definitely go down. My husband and I retired. We just want to live out our golden years in the now clean air that we have. We want to keep the peace, quietness. We want to be able to sit outdoors and look up into the night sky and see the beautiful moon and twinkling bright stars. This is an agricultural area where we raise crops and cattle. It's not for Dominion, who has said we will be able to receive this natural gas, which is not true. This gas will have to be fracked, which will emit unsafe gases and poisons, polluting this most precious air that we breathe. Dominion has not been telling the truth. They are modern day gangsters. All they are interested in is monetary gain. 
They just want to come in here and condemn this property as if we don't exist. Next is Barb Gottlieb. Hello, uh, my name is Barbara Gottlieb. I'm the program director for environment and health at Physicians for Social Responsibility. We're a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Washington, DC and chapters across the United States. Uh, in my previously submitted testimony, I addressed the health impacts of pipelines and compressor stations. Today, I'm gonna to focus in on the health risks associated specifically with air emissions from compressor stations. So what you've been hearing uh, from the, uh, the people of Virginia and the people of uh, West Virginia about the threats to health is very true. I'm going to just add a little bit of scientific background to um, give that, that uh, more scientific basis to what you've been told. It's known and it's already well documented that compressor stations emit methane and other gases. In fact, a study by uh, a University of Houston team, that's from Texas, found that emission rates from compressor stations in Texas's Barnett Shale were fi far higher than emissions from fracking well pads. Compressor stations may leak due to the malfunction of a component, and they also release gases intentionally. Uh, the most dramatic form of these intentional releases is what they call blowdowns, which are the release of gases through the blowdown valve. Now these blowdowns are used to control the pressure within the system. They create a 30 to 60 meter high gas plume that can last as long as three hours. Normally, blowdowns are not reflected in the estimates of emissions and the possible exposures that utility companies or pipeline companies use when they are submitting their applications for permitting. Thus, the uh, estimates in those applications are often grossly understated, meaning local residents may be exposed to far greater concentrations of toxic substances than the permitting decision assumes. I want to share with you very, very briefly the findings of three uh, fairly recent studies about leakage from compressor stations. In 2017, researchers from the University of Texas investigated emissions from natural gas compressor stations throughout the states of Pennsylvania and New York. They found that compressors emitted plumes of methane that spread downwind and were measurable a full mile away. In a second study, uh, this one was conducted in 2016 by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Re Registry, ATSDR. It's an agency of the U.S. government. This study focused on fine particulate matter, what we call PM 2.5, and it evaluated data that had been collected by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency near a natural gas compressor station in Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania. The study found PM 2.5 levels at levels where if there were long-term exposure, it could cause serious health effects. And I'll tell you about those health effects in just a moment. Of course, we know that with a compressor station, which runs 24 seven for years and years, as long as the gas is flowing, there's a high likelihood of continuous long-term exposure. And in another study dated October, 2017, researchers at the University of Albany, that's in the state of New York, Institute for Health and the Environment prepared a 300 page technical report on the health effects of the emissions from 18 existing natural gas compressor stations in that state. <clears throat> what they found was that collectively these sites, these uh, 18 compressor stations released 40 million pounds of 70 different contaminants, that's 70, over a seven year period making natural gas compressor stations the seventh largest point, sor point source of air pollution in the state of New York. And as you know, that's a state with a uh, you know, pretty big city there and its own share of industry. By volume, the largest emissions were from nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds such as benzene, formaldehyde, and particulate matter. So as I said, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the health impacts of these pollutants because they can cause serious harm to health. Nitrogen oxides, the um, most common or most uh, concentrated of the pollutants coming from compressor stations, 
decrease oxygen absorption and weaken the lungs. They can also, even at low concentrations, aggravate asthma. Carbon monoxide, you've probably heard about that. If you inhale it in high enough concentrations, it can kill you because it, uh, in, your, in your blood, it, uh, it bonds with the blood cells where oxygen would normally, normally bond and basically you suffocate to death from the inside. Volatile organic compounds are a very large class of chemicals, but uh, they are linked to cancer, nervous system effects. And when we say uh, nervous system effects, think the brain, miscarriages, blood disorders, and other effects. But one of the most common volatile organic compounds associated with uh, methane gases is, is uh, benzene, which is itself a uh, carcinogen. Uh, it causes cancer. Uh, formaldehyde, another of the gases on the list, is also a known carcinogen. And then particulate matter. Particulate matter is a category rather than a, a, a particular substance. It, it refers to particles that are very, very small, even microscopic. Particulate matter, when we inhale it, can damage the lungs and the heart because it, the particles are so fine they can cross the, the blood barrier in the lungs and circulate through the entire body. They can cause premature death in people with heart or lung disease. Particulate matter is also associated with preterm birth and low birth weight. For those who don't know it, those are the leading causes of infant death in the United States. So we're talking about, about death uh, and disease, not just for uh, the hale and hearty among us, but also for the most, most vulnerable. I would also point out one other contaminant that's particularly relevant in, in Virginia for both the, uh, the ACP and the MVP for both of the two pipelines that we're talking about. Since these compressor, compressor stations along these two pipelines carry gas that's extracted from the Marcellus Shale, that gas may very well carry gaseous radon. Radon occurs naturally in this part of the country when the gas is fracked, it comes to the surface with the gas. Radon, as you probably know, is radioactive. Although it breaks down relatively um, uh, quickly, it breaks down into two other also radioactive substances. Finally, I'd like to mention some health concerns that are specific to the Atlantic Coast's proposed compressor station. Uh, because what we know about the impacts of emissions from compressor stations is alarming. And in the case of the proposed Atlantic Coast compressor station, we have two additional reasons to be concerned. First of all, the compressor station proposed to be built in Union Hill is massive. It's huge. It has four, it would have four gas-fired uh, turbine engines with horsepower of 54,000 HP, ranging up to 57,000 horsepower in the winter. That's enormous. And it's a lot larger than most of the other compressor stations that are built. Compressor stations are typically placed about every 40 to 70 miles along a pipeline. This proposed compressor station would be so powerful, it would be designed, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be designed to pressurize gas to transmit over 200 miles in each direction. So the compressor station is huge, the magna magnitude of the health threats would likewise be greater. Second of all, as you've been hearing from a, a number of our um, testifiers today, although Buckingham County is rural, the compressor station is not being placed in some unpopulated area. It's been proposed to be placed in a community near residents' homes and subjecting the people of Union Hill to severe threats to their health. That's totally unacceptable. This compressor station and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline itself should not be allowed. Thank you very much. And it's my pleasure now to turn the microphone over to a wonderful activist whom I'm proud to count as a friend, Ms. Chad Oba. Chad? So thank you, Barb, uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Chad Oba. I uh, <clears throat> am the chair and a founding member of Friends of Buckingham, a grassroots organization that was quickly put together to defend our our air, our land, our water, uh, and our cultural and historical <clears throat> uh, places of residence from the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Um, Dominion right now is po poised to begin construction of the ACP uh, as windfill profits are promised to the company and its shareholders and other investors. They are no matter what guaranteed a 14% return which is paid by us, the, the ratepayers, but many others would suffer significant losses. Our costs are not factored in. Property owners directly impacted 
are having their property taken from them through intimidating and very misleading easement offers. Uh, they're using eminent domain for their gain and, and not for the public good. This has been mentioned in numerous of the presentations so far. Uh, and all but one county along the 600 mile length of the S ACP is below medium income for the state. Uh, where I live in the Union Hill area of Buckingham County, uh, I forgot to mention that I am an impacted landowner being uh, that I'm quite close, 1.3 to the proposed compressor station and uh, am surrounded by pipelines. I would be uh, surrounded by pipelines. I have a, uh, a uh, lateral line of the transco directly across the road from me. Um, but landowners are being forced to give up easements while being taken to court for eminent domain. Um, many do not have the financial means to fight this out in court. And this is providing a, a certain level of divisiveness within the community where I live as people try to survive as best they can. Um, and this is a, a direct assault on determining the best use of our own property. Uh, I mentioned I live only uh, a little over a mile, my husband and I, from the proposed 57,000 horsepower compressor station, the only one for the entire state. And this is in the middle of, uh, Lakshmi had told you about, an 85% Freedman found African American community. Uh, for those of us well within the blast zone and now the proposed compressor station locality, we receive absolutely no compensation for the loss of our property values on our homes and the constant 24 seven noise, but worse so the toxic pollutants that Barb just told you all about. Um, our health was going to suffer greatly. Um, our population is mostly 65 and up elderly and very young children um, <clears throat> who often have grandparents as their caretakers. Uh, because their adult children have, their, or their parents have left the locality for work because there's very little work in Buckingham. Um, so our property is going to lose considerable value. My husband and I have lived in this neighborhood for 34 years. Uh, we own an old antebellum simple farmhouse that we have renovated to meet our own needs. Um, it is our sole uh, investment. And it is, it is it's what we have as a legacy for our own children and to ensure that we have some financial resource uh, into the future. This will disappear due to the uh, compressor station proximity to our home. But the worst of it is, and always been my concern, are the threats to our health and safety. Uh, we pay the most with our lives and our property loss and do not get one cent in compensation. I work as a mental health practitioner in the county, uh, and I have been for 25 years, and I have been witness to and experienced myself the anticipatory stress of not knowing what the future holds. This is weighing very heavily on my neighbors as they've been forced to postpone their present and future plans for their lives long periods of uncertainty and looming threat create chronic stress symptoms. Our bodily, bodies can handle short periods of that, but long periods have a, a very devastating effect on us. Um, we've been battling this threat for nearly four long years now, and it's just caused harmful chronic stress symptoms. And many of my neighbors, um, Many of us, as we've mentioned earlier, are elderly and we're already suffering with health issues. Um, this further uh, causes a, a lot of stress on, on our systems <clears throat> and will shorten whatever lifespan we have left. And people are filled with dread as this is being, as trees are being cut around them. Some of the trees they began to cut and then they got a stop order. But it, it's very intimidating when you have trees coming down right next to your home. Um, and Dominion's making its intimidating presence known. Every time we get a little victory, they show up in force. Um, people out on the trucks out on the road, uh, trees being caught, whatever it takes to send their message. Um, and people are being told to make the best of it 
as it's going to happen. So people, you know, get discouraged. Um, we are being denied the most basic, the most basic of human rights, health, clean air and water, and the ability to use our own land, but also the right to be heard at all levels of government. Um, our health, our future, our lives are on the line and they matter. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to be heard. Hello, I'm Jiva Abate, director of Yogaville Environmental Solutions. And I've been working with the same group of people that you're hearing testimony from for the sake of our community, which is five miles from the Union Hill community and only a few thousand feet from the actual ACP route. Satchitananda Ashram Yogaville is a unique spiritual center located on 660 acres in Buckingham County, Virginia. We offer training in classic yoga practices, including prayer, meditation, and hatha yoga. Our lifestyle, spiritual, and religious practices necessitate a clean and peaceful environment. The ACP route next to Yogaville places us and our resident students, teachers, staff, which is estimated at 120 to 200 people on any day in the dangerous impact zone for any potential leak resulting in fire and explosion. The ACP is a threat to our water, property, school, homes, our Lotus Temple in the picture here, and our ongoing operations. This is a threat to the safety, health, and homes of our friends, our neighbors, and the whole Buckingham County community around where the ACP is coming. The impact zone, as you can see in this slide, shows the ACP with the red line, then a yellow line drawn to our temple, showing it's about 3,300 feet from the ACP's route. Then the next line down is to our school, which is approximately 1,660 feet from the ACP. That's kindergarten through 12. And then the bottom yellow line shows our community at the bottom of that screen, which is about 1,800 feet from the ACP. This is involving the threat of fire, leaking, pollution. So it's a life and death issue for Buckingham County property owners and for Yogaville residents. We are deep in the impact zone where any fire could burn quickly. And we're going to talk about the safety issues related to that. Noxious, noxious fumes and toxic chemicals have been detected within 10 miles of the Leesburg Loudoun County Dominion Compressor Station by residents in Loudoun County. That's documented. So we're concerned that we're five miles from the compressor station. So those fumes and any problem there could also impact our community. The Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration treats natural gas as a hazardous material. This is important to understand. The number of serious accidents every year average between 30 and 40 major accidents, only those accidents that cost the pipeline companies more than $50,000 per year are reported. So we're not in a position to understand all the accidents or fires, but it's important to know that this happens regularly and this is a hazardous situation. In Highway 77, we had a huge explosion of a 20 inch natural gas pipeline. It melted the guardrails, the pavement, caused injury to five homes, 
And obviously you can see this is a huge problem. Our pipe that will be proposed to come close to us is 42 inches at 1440 uh, pressure per square inch. This is the aftermath of a natural gas compressor station leak and explosion. So this resulted in a large fireball. The person who was near the site had to run about a mile away to be safe. And three homes were evacuated. The truck and the property around the compressor station was destroyed. This is the Durham Woods natural gas pipeline explosion. This occurred in New Jersey where a 36 inch diameter pipeline broke and exploded into flames. The resulting fire destroyed 14 of the apartment buildings and caused over 150 uh, guests to run into the woods because just like with the ACP, there was no evacuation plan and the police or first responders could not get to the site for about 20 or 30 minutes. This is a major problem. We want to show you that this is the compressor station area. The yellow triangle is where the compressor station will be installed. The red line is the probable impact radius around the blue line, which is the ACP route. So you see the church in the robin's egg blue color cross within the probable impact zone. So we again are subject to the injustice of having to be threatened by a pipeline that we have studied and realized is not necessary. Now, in addition to the fact that we're close to the route, we also are in the middle of what's called the Central Virginia Seismic Zone, includes Buckingham County. So this is a common area for seismic activity, earthquakes, and this is another danger. All you need is a crack in this pipe to have a leak and a possible fire. So this is a slide that April showed that shows the Transco pipeline is the pipeline that's already underutilized and could supply all the gas to the same regions that both the MVP and ACP are targeted to support. If you go to the top of that Transco purple line, you see that the Cove Point pipeline is right there running to Cove Point, allowing the natural gas to be liquefied and then shipped off site. With such a little demand in any of the domestic regions, we can anticipate that that pipeline will be used to shuffle that gas overseas, which is not a reason to apply eminent domain and it will raise the cost of domestic gas. The Buckingham County comprehensive plan that has already been written shows that this area that the pipeline's coming to was intended to be a rural agricultural forest area. These areas are located farthest from the centralized public services such as first responders, fire, rescue, and law enforcement. And so protecting this area is key to the comprehensive plan. The special use permit that was granted by our county officials violates this plan and violates their own request for safety. So the ACP mitigation plan was inadequate, weak, or in the case of an evacuation plan, non-existent. And we all have already covered some of the impacts to our water, the horizontal drilling, the lack of critical review of all the waterways that could be impacted, the creeks, the wells, and the springs. So the conclusion is that this is an unnecessary project that is an abuse of eminent domain. It's a threat to farm use, livestock, land use, legacy properties, threat to property values, threat to the rural pristine environment and air and water that we require, an impact to existing businesses such as Yogaville or farms or any new land development. So we are asking you, please protect our lives from these hazardous leaks and explosions protect our health, our children, our elders, our constitutional right to private property, our property values and land use, and our animals and our families. Thank you. And good afternoon. My name is Swami Dayananda. I'm one of the monastic members of Yogaville in Buckingham, Virginia, 
Yoga Bill is a retreat center. Our community has about 275 residents and we host about 10,000 guests annually who come for health, for meditation, and for their retreat. So today I would like to show you um, the place, the people, the wild animals, trees, forests, and our water bodies, all of which will be negatively impacted by the building of Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and which would run as close as 700 to 1,000 feet from our homes. So Yogaville is known for Light of Truth Universal Shrine Lotus and Interface Shrine. And the entire Yogaville was founded by Sri Swami Sachidananda, who is regarded as a pioneer of the interfaith movement and as an apostle of peace. He is also one of the most revered yoga masters of all time. We practice easeful and peaceful, useful life, starting with health, meditation, and service. So Yoga Bill is designed to serve as a model of how individuals of all different backgrounds can live and work together in harmony. Yogaville functions as uh, the place of principles of truth, nonviolence, spirit of dedication, environmental stewardship, and universal brotherhood. This is, these are the images from our uh, classrooms of Hatha Yoga classes for health, meditation rooms, our accommodations, and all the uh, different classes and workshops that we hold for children and adults. And some of the programs that we provide every weekend. And now we are here showing the, our kitchen, which receive organic vegetables from our own farm. They provide us fresh produce for our vegetarian lifestyle. There, these are different um, members of Yogaville and Yogaville people also live in harmony with wild animals, deers, bears, bald eagles, and many other creatures. We have ponds, streams, over 20 bubbling uh, springs and our Yogaville Green Team's environmental education for youths have showed that our streams host creatures which only live in purest water. This is Yogaville Environmental Solutions uh, logo, uh, which is a organization that uh, works to oppose the pipeline as well as move us toward renewable energy. The director of which is Jiva Abate, who was the speaker before me. This is the image of our beautiful James River bordering our property. James River was known by some native people as Waloa, Winding River. And if you can see this map, there is a lotus shrine to the right. And that red line is the uh, approximate line of the pipeline, which will line run right by uh, us. And this is the image of the pipeline construction. There will be two pipelines, 42 inches, side by side. And we are particularly concerned about the James River and its well-being because the proposed horizontal directional drilling uh, will likely damage our ecological uh, health of our, the wetland. And I'm going to stay on this image for a little while to speak about the HDD, horizontal directional drilling, because all of us here in this community uh, have wells. We depend on the aquifer or the water below our grounds. 
for our drinking and all other uses of water. So geotechnical site investigation report by Geosyntec for ACP, which was not shown to us that crossing a James River, river and I'm going to quote, the boring log provides bedrock descriptions that indicate conditions that can negatively impact HEDD feasibility. Specifically, the voids encountered in the marble are indicative of solution, the same as encountered in karstic limestone. Such solution cavities can substantially deflect the drill pipe uh, due to low cycle fatigue. The material characteristic that most frequently prevents successful HDD installations is the large grain content in the form of cobbles and boulders, which are found under James River. This and other material found under James River are the type of material described as most frequently preventing successful HDD installation. So uh, it also says that at the least additional geotechnical borings should be conducted, at least additional studies, to verify the bedrock conditions underlying the James River. Our communities have been asked for and many other communities, in fact, stream by stream studies of more than hundreds of rivers and water streams crossing. So this has gone unheard and not responded to. So during this Water Control Board uh, DEQ's hearing, we hope that uh, they will change their mind and actually do those studies. And I'll just go quickly for the rest of the images to show. Um, I think we have seen these before. Yes, James River. Downward. Yes, I think there we were. Yes. And just to show you how much of peaceful protest and uh, respect and reverence to water and our nature we have done. Now, you'll see that James River has had 500 year flood in 1980s and couple of 100 year flood in more recent times. These are all of our community members doing peaceful protest. And we share this beautiful photo of James River at sunset to ask all of you to please help us to protect our water, our environment, so that we can continue our life here and service to our children, future generation, and all of our guests. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Heidi Divia Bertu, and I live uh, downstream about a mile from where the James River would be crossed by the ACP. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been living um, on a bluff above the James River for about 27 years. And I'm the secretary of Friends of Buckingham and project manager for the baseline testing and also a member of Buckingham We the People. So communities across the US and around the world are being told that they don't have the right to make critical decisions for themselves. They're told they cannot say no to fracking pipelines or factory farming. They are told they cannot say yes to sustainable food or energy systems. Agencies such as the EPA do not actually protect us, rather they regulate the amount of harm that's inflicted on our communities. Our system of law elevates corporate decision making over community decision making. The work of CELDEF, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, is a paradigm shift towards democratic rights of local self-government, environmental rights, the rights of nature, and workers' rights. The grassroots organization, Buckingham We the People, has worked with CELDA for the past two years to create the James River Natural Community Bill of Rights, the first such ordinance in Virginia. Uh, excerpts from the bill are as follows. The James River Natural Community possesses the right to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve, including the right to restoration. It has the right to a clean and healthy environment, including the right to clean air, pure water, and healthy soil. To restore and protect the James River natural community, we 
recognize that we must secure the highest protections through the recognition of legal rights for nature herself. Therefore, we deem it necessary to alter our system of local government, and we do so by adopting this ordinance, the James River Natural Community Bill of Rights. The James River watershed plays important roles that, that contamination would destroy. It is a water source for wells and for communities along its length, including the Richmond metropolitan area with a population of 1.3 million. It provides habitat for wildlife, recreation, tourism, irrigation, transportation. It provides essential wetlands for absorbing and mitigating seasonal and storm flooding. The James River is the northern border of Buckingham County the Yogaville community and my personal land. From Virginia Tech Extension uh, Service, a uh, little info, Buckingham County uh, lies in the Piedmont Physiographic Province, the largest in Virginia, extending west of the fall line to the Blue Ridge Mountains. The diversity of geology results in wide variations of groundwater quality and well yields. Groundwater use at many locations is limited. For example, a few areas have problems with high iron concentrations and low pH. Hard crystalline igneous and metamorphic formations dominate this region. The size and number of fractures and faults which store and transmit groundwater in the bedrock decrease with depth. So the most significant water supplies are found within a few hundred feet of the surface. Because of the range in groundwater quality and quantity in this region, as well as the varying potential for contamination, well site evaluation and well monitoring is very important. So says our great institutions. The Mountain Valley Pipeline crosses the Roanoke River, impacting the water of 100,000 people in the city of Roanoke. The Roanoke River also feeds the lake from which the water is piped to Virginia Beach, thereby affecting the water of that city of nearly a half a million people. Mini Wakoni, water is life. Lo et la vie. Thank you. All right, I'm Anita Puckett. I'm at Virginia Tech in Appalachian Studies. I'm a consultant on this project with the Preserve Montgomery County um, uh, Foundation, Preserve Montgomery County, uh, yes, it's just Preserve Montgomery County, Virginia nonprofit. Why can't, you know, I've said it a thousand times a day. Um, it's one of the things about being coming a little bit later is that all of these people have all contributed to my presentation and also have reinforced what I'm about to say. So I'm going to be editing as I go through this, so I'm not repetitive. And April, I'm very grateful for what you said. And Heidi, you just helped me as well. And so let's move on here. <clears throat> the 303 mile or 488 kilometer Mountain Valley pipeline carries frac gas um, and it's partic uh, particulate residue of carcinogens from West Virginia and Pennsylvania production fields across some of the most environmentally challenging geological and ecological terrain in the world, not just the United States. Highly diverse in flora and fauna on par with the Brazilian rainforest in its geological, biogeological diversity. It has offered hundreds of unique aquatic and floral species found only in specific ecozones supported both by sedimentary and metamorphic geomorphology. And what makes us different from West Virginia is this metamorph this metamorphic rock geomorphology because it's fractured, it's harder, it's going to require blasting and all kinds of other adjustments in construction and maintenance that aren't present in other places in West Virginia. The Virginia region, which is where I'm focusing, is impacted by the MVP and it is still pristine for the most part, nurtured and supported by many of the long-term residents up to nine generations in 250 years who live there. The complexity of the biosphere has in turn led to extremely nuanced and deeply attached human, uh, uh, human ecological relations that literally attach these longtime landowners and their kin to the land around them and deeply significant cultural relationships that many label as cultural attachment or place attachment. Losing these identity relations through mega pipeline construction and frack gas transmission is destroying them and will continue to destroy them and the natural environment in which they identify because of these deeply rooted nuanced relations. These identifications <clears throat> have resulted historically in their being labeled Appalachian hillbillies who are deficient and backward in popular media and in the general American and Virginia governmental ethos. 
These derationations have resulted in ongoing state and federal governmental stances or actual policies that are doing little to nothing to mitigate or stop the human rights degradations they are currently experiencing, uh, as others have talked about. Now, I understand the cursor isn't working, but if you look at this map, the uh, red line arc uh, separates West Virginia from Virginia, sort of, kind of. But the three little circles represent places I'll be talking about mostly in the rest of my talk. The one closest to the arc is over in Jefferson National Forest. The one in the middle has to do with Newport, Virginia. And the one on the right, the, the third one on the right has to do with Eastern Montgomery County and with the Spring Holler Reservoir that Heidi just talked about uh, and that area in there. So uh, the first area to be talked about, which Barbara Gottlieb did so very well, are the health issues. And I'm gonna be borrowing from my uh, Physicians for Social Justice colleague, T uh, Tina Schmooz, uh, to say just a few things, because Barbara said so many of them. Every stage of the MVP from tree clearing to construction to operation carries pollution. It does not stop, it continues from beginning until it stopped use, being used and is pulled up again. Um, that uh, the pipeline will cross over at least 100 waterways in the watershed of the Roanoke River, serving over 200,000 people. And as Heidi just noted, we're gonna get down into half a million uh, by the time it gets um, to the southeast of us. Uh, over 100,000 tons of new sediment, and I think that's a low number, into the Roanoke River will come from the project. Carries long buried toxic pesticides, we haven't talked about that, which can pollute downstream waters as they flood and brought out these old pieces of dirt that have been sitting there for a long time. These old pesticides will become active again. In the Mountain Valley Pipeline, there is no mercaptan, no odorant. And this means that residents, wildlife, and visitors will not know when there's a leak. And so we're going to have issues in terms of uh, uh, methane poisoning that will have profound impacts. And we're not allowed to put things on the easement as well. That turns out at least not right now. The transmission pipeline failure has increased sixfold since 2010. And on this slide here, I just put this in from Tina's presentation and you can see that uh, you can't necessarily read the numbers, it might be hard to read, but back in uh, the 1940s, we had a lot, then they went down, down, and down. But in 2010s, where they've just come back up and as high as they've ever been, and they attribute this to sloppy construction, sloppy maintenance, and uh, uh, to just leaks and other kinds of issues because they're not paying any attention to the environment. Uh, water and species losses are inevitable. Um, and the very livelihoods of local residents, as many people have talked about with the way people hunt, gather, uh, use subsistence agriculture and other ways of getting fishing. And I just put up two that we pretty much know will go. One is the brook trout. Uh, it's over in, um, uh, it's, not, it's, in, it's not as endangered as the Roanoke log perch, but it is threatened and it probably will be out of the Roanoke River very soon because sedimentation during construction is happening right now. The Roanoke log perch is very much endangered and it requires a very pristine waters that aren't too acidic and they're being destroyed right now uh, along the North Fork as we are having our session here today. Now I have some quotes from people but uh, Irene uh, covered some of that so I'm gonna skip that for the moment. Um, the steep slopes in the region uh, guarantees extensive sediment sedimentation. Over here on the right, we have an existing 18 inch pipeline easement on Peters Mountain, which is in the uh, boundary between Giles County, Virginia and Moreau County, West Virginia. Uh, this particular, it goes up to about 4,000 feet, 3,800 feet. And uh, you've got this uh, collapse of the slope that has come down because it's so steep. And this collapse has caused heavy sedimentation down into a sinkhole at the bottom. This is on the West Virginia side the water in that sinkhole that was going underground uh, was used by an adjoining community for their public water. Their uh, filtration system had to be changed or the filters had to be changed about every three months. Now it's almost every week because of this collapse. They cannot afford it, they're going out of business, they have no water. Over on the left, if you can see it, is the slopes are so steep 
that construction requires that they use guy wires and cables to hold the equipment to literally dig it. And as others have shown, they are not going to be putting in adequate kinds of mitigations to hold the sedimentation back. So it's going to be a major problem. They're going to, because of the metamorphic rock in Virginia, they're going to have to blast and blast a lot with dynamite. And um, we're talking about, some people are calling it mountaintop removal. Uh, Southwest Virginia finds that offensive, but nevertheless, it's something like it. Karst is, in our area, is another factor. Now, karst is, um, require, is, is created because you have sedimentary rock, usually limestone dolomite, that dissolves easily with water. And you get these expansive underground systems of water connectivities through such things, and I hope my cursor is working. You have caves, you're going to have underground streams that come out like Sinking Creek does over in the Newport area, and then you have sinkholes which come down. Now what this means is all of these are connected. If one becomes contaminated or poisoned, it's going to impact uh, miles and miles and miles of other people's waters, community water supplies, underground species, ground species, and so on. Here is this particular slide shows a well coming down into a karst topography and how complex they are. This one is what mountain, the kind of thing that mountain, the bottom one is what Mountain Valley is doing. What they're doing with the sinkholes is they're treating them as a static feature instead of the dynamic features that they are. So they're just pouring boulders into them and then building the pipeline over it. And I'm afraid I can't remember who talked about it, but the idea is you've got these, these, these uh, pipelines, these 42 inches, are not going to be stable in that environment because it is dynamic. And over time, it will leak, it will probably rupture. And then you have the Giles County seismic zone, which uh, April mentioned, which is an active seismic zone. And it will come in and it is a, as earthquake, as having earthquakes may indeed cause it to break. And then we will get leaks and explosions. So uh, the karst, we're in an incredibly heavy karst area. And I thought Irene was going to cover that, so I didn't put my slide back in to show you where it is. But it's everywhere in Virginia and in parts of, in the Virginia sections and also in the West Virginia sections. This particular slide is one that shows you the extent and what's going to probably happen. In the upper left-hand corner is Brush Mountain, and about 25 miles away to the right is the Spring Hollow Reservoir, that Heidi mentioned about. And this, the water, we've done dye testing, the water from Brush Mountain will come down underground along into the Roanoke River, all the way through this whole field here will be impacted. We're talking about a huge area here. Will go, sediment will go, toxins will go, pesticides will go into the Spring Holler Reservoir, and they will have to filter it out. They're anticipating a multi-million dollar increase in their filtration they're going to need and that will be passed on to the ratepayers and to the local citizens, not to mention what it will do to the environment. A very, uh, hundreds of thousands of people and now half a million people uh, will also be in involved because they're selling their water. And then this one um, is uh, the potential destruction of cultural capital and communities' abilities to survive. And perhaps the most salient is Newport, this little community in Giles County, Virginia, the MVP has been approved to run directly through the Newport Rural Historic District, close to, too close to, like within 15 feet of one, one structure, 50 feet of most of many of them, of uh, homes, churches, schools, community centers, and even the volunteer fire rescue station. And what we have here is two views of the same thing. At the top is looking down road, the road, Road 42, and you can see in the right-hand corner where they've cut the trees or be constructing, if not today, they'll be constructing there very, very soon. And then the bottom slide is looking from the top of the mountain down through the tree cutting. At the bottom is the exact same piece of road that you're seeing in the top picture. And if you can, if my cursor is working at the top, you will see a local church, the Methodist church. Beyond it are some stores and homes. To the left are some homes. Down in the lower left corner on the other side of the cut is the community center. And beyond that is the fire station, all within very easy reach of uh, some kind of blast or issue leakage from the pipeline. And so this, there were these rural historic districts, it was created in 1790s, these homes, some of them go back earlier, 
and they are 200 year old homes in many cases. The church is almost that old. And there are, these historic districts are formed by deep relationships and linkages between natural and historic features and the people who live and work in them. Just look at the slide. How can an area retain its historical significance? It's deeply felt and constantly regenerated sense of animacy and personhood with a 150 foot right of way through it and a final 50 foot easement um, between historical structures dating back to the late 1700s when you have this 42 inch pipeline. Now, uh, Preservation Virginia has put Newport on its state list of most endangered historic places. Here is something I can take you to it right now out here in Catawba Valley. It looks very much like this as they're digging through to plant the pipeline here very close to Newport. I haven't been out there in a few days. I don't know if it's looking exactly like this, but it will look very much like this right through the center of town. Um, and so, um, uh, and how can residents live here when they live in fear? And we've been talking about that, that it will leak and contaminate their water, land, or air if not actually explode, and they can't sell their properties, of course, because of the pipeline. And this scenario is not unique. It's true of every actual community and culturally attached home place near where the MVP runs. Now there is pushback. We're getting pushback in terms of our own residents. All of us are doing this, but direct action has surfaced as well. Direct action for the ACP and the MVP. In our area, here we have where the corridor is going, this is over on Brush Mountain at the top, is where we're gonna get the, uh, the no, I'm, yeah, this is Brush Mountain, and this is where we got the Appalachian Trail at the top, and we're in Jefferson National Forest, where we currently have two tree sitters out of five total that still remain perched high in the Jefferson National Forest, and April mentioned this earlier. On the Giles County, on the Montgomery, I mean, sorry, on the Virginia side in Montgomery County is Nutty, He's about 34 years old. And on the Monroe County, West Virginia side is a man named, uh, with a pseudonym of Deckard. Both of them are on Peters Mountain, which this is not, but it's close to it. Nutty has been in her monopod longer uh, than has Deckard since April 6th. And she's had no, been able to get no restocking of her food or water because of the National Forest Service. She has only a few applesauce containers left as of yesterday and some power bars. Water is coming from collecting rainwater and luckily it rained yesterday. And on the ground supporters of whom there are many, uh, they cannot get to her. The Forest Service and others are arresting them if they try and they are armed to the teeth and they are not letting them get in. Um, and she cannot get medical care. We don't know what kind of shape she's in. Of course, her cell is dead by now, pretty much dead. She's got a charger, but it's communications are, are weak and not happening very often. And then the other thing is she can't get any legal counsel. The Forest Service people are saying, just let her come down out of the tree. This is in violation, direct violation of the Geneva, of, of the Geneva Convention and other state and federal laws regarding the treatment of our citizens. Nevertheless, as of this writing, both Nutty and Deckard are still in the protection of the Appalachians. She's, by the way, in her monopod. Let me give you a picture of this. This is what they're doing to her at night shining light at her so she can't sleep. They play horrible music for a while, but they've stopped that. And she's protecting the, the guy wires that are coming down here from the, the from monopod or keeping them from opening the gate to the Appalachian Trail so they can get across and do more cutting over there. Deckard is just in the forest, similar kinds of situations though. The situation, okay. Um, and um, then so direct action grows and legal actions increase. Citizens are assuming a stance of asserting their democratic rights to resist construction, such as in this tribunal, and the operation of a methane transmission line with a minimal, mostly no local or domestic use as we're trying to keep on fighting it. But before I stop, I need to contextualize this discussion of human environmental impacts at the local regional levels to the larger global issues of climate change. And I want to refer you to this a really fascinating report constructed under Obama's administration, and it's called A Bridge Too Far, How Appalachian Basin Gas Pipeline Expansion Will Undermine U.S. Climate Goals. Um, and I'm just gonna make a couple of comments. Please read it if you can. I think maybe we can get it up on our website. First, the Appalachian Basin is the key source of potential U.S. gas production growth in the future because of the Utica and the Marcellus. 
And in the past decade, natural gas production in the Appalachian Basin has experienced unprecedented growth, particularly in, in, in the Marcellus and Utica in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. Um, so the gas production has grown 13 fold since 2009, reaching over 18 billion cubic feet per day in 2015. It is widely expected that production in the Appalachian Basin region will double over current levels by 2030s. And in 2010, the Appalachian Basin produced just 4% of the US gas production, but by 2030, it could provide 50%. With the completion and operation of the MVP, um, let's see, whereby, yeah, the MVP and with Trump administration's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, there is almost no limit on how much natural gas can be dumped into the air and surface. Climate change over the tipping point appears inevitable if we don't stop this thing. With a project, two point feet, with a project of 2.4 billion cubic feet per day of transmission, the Mountain Valley Pipeline will be a major contributor to, to this disastrous outcome. It's, they're counting on it for that particular um, uh, financial gain. Now, that ends officially what I wanted to say, but I do want to add that omitted from this brief presentation has been the archaeological impact on Native American sites. Roby will come in, and other people have talked about it as well. But they are there, and I just didn't have time to deal with them. And they're not uncommonly overlooked by, they are uncommonly overlooked by MVP. The archaeological sites are. They're hiring really inadequate people to do it. And um, the African American communities we have along in the Virginia side of the MVP, I haven't had a chance to talk about them as either but Union Hill and they have a lot in common. But regardless, the situation is often the same for, as it is for the whites, for ratiination, dismissal, and dehumanization by a major corporation, government agencies, and several state agencies that are denying Appalachian residents full participation in democratic process. A situation, if not a condition, that continues the labeling of them, which we're hearing almost every day, as just a bunch of dumb hillbillies. And now I'll pass it on to Roby. Um, so this presentation today is uh, for the People's Tribunal on Human Rights and Environmental Justice Impacts of the Frack Gas in Infrastructure. Um, in summary, this presentation will share the information about one of North Carolina's state recognized tribes, the Lumbee. My testimony will be detailing some of the impacts that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline will have on the Lumbee people and the tribe. Once again, my name is Robbie Goins. Um, I'm a Lumbee Indian from Robinson County, North Carolina. This testimony is based on my personal knowledge, information, and belief. I am a member of the Lumbee tribe, and my family has been in this area of North Carolina for many generations. I have seen historical documents showing that my ancestors have been in or around Robinson County area since the 1700s. My family and I have long fought for the health and prosperity of the Lumbee tribe and its community within Rawson County. Um, early on, um, the earliest European documentation of Native Americans in these communities was done by um, John Herbert in 1725, who was an English commissioner of Indian trade for the Winua factory on the Black River. Herbert identified um, the four Suwon speaking communities, which is Sorrel, PD, Scovano, and Waccamaw. Modern day Lumbees claim connections to these settlements. The Indians in Robinson County who have called Cro who are have been called Croatan and Cherokee are descended mainly from certain Suwon speaking tribes, but um, we are predominantly um, Sorrel or Kiowee. Um, and we also have some remnants of the Eno and Shakori tribes. Um, it is also important to um, state that um, some of the families that originated here also spoke Algonquin and Iroquois um, languages. The Lummi tribe is a state recognized tribe um, um, and it has about a uh, 60,000 enrollment membership and most of the members living here in Robinson County. And the Lumbees uh, were recognized as Native American tribe by the United States Congress in 1956 under conditions that it agreed to at the time, which did not allow them to have benefits available to other federally recognized tribes. The Lumbee are one of the eight state recognized North 
American tribes in North Carolina that have been recognized by the state. And um, um, this, this route actually impacts four or five major tribes. Archaeological evidence shows that Native American cultures have long occupied present day Robinson County and Indians of diverse cultures are continuing to reside here during the historical period after European colonization. Um, some of the home places, um, some of the people here, you know, they, they talk about home and its importance to us. Um, some of them are local farmers and they, they say that the soil gives us life. We treat the land as being one with our existence. They treat the land like dirt, meaning these developers, these companies, these corporations that are coming in, they, they, they don't see the value that the soil um, that they're building on actually possess. And then um, some other landowners in the area um, gave a quote saying, having a pipeline directly under your land means that you are in a blast zone from which you may not escape. The pipeline is already here. Our tribe has already been impacted by past pipelines. We need to be planning for our future, one that will not include a pipe that may fail and or corrode in the future. Um, and this is an old story of injustice. Uh, the pipeline's threat is an old story, one that my family and the community have um, been familiar with for over time. Um, the companies and government officials responsible for the pipeline have not been transparent throughout this process. And those of us who will be most affected by the pipeline have been ignored and misinformed. North Carolina of two centuries ago presented an unbroken expanse of longleaf pine. Curiously enough, they grew up a legend that only the pines of North Carolina could produce the particular grade of tar that had found such favor throughout the world. North Carolina prospered because of the legend and mon mon monopolized the business. It became famous throughout the world for its turpentine products. So you can see in the past, um, this region um, was basically uh, taken from its resources, um, a lot of, a large amount of trees for an industry, a turpentine industry that sold it to other countries for um, um, na naval, naval um, construction for their ships at, at sea. Um, right now, um, I know everyone uh, before me has talked about um, some of the pipelines and things. Here in North Carolina, um, you can see with this line here is the proposed route of the ACP. And you can also see what many have spoke about is the Transco. And, and again, the Transco is uh, an interstate or um, type pipeline that goes through many, many um, states to deliver gas. And I think they deliver about 9.8 um, billion um, gas each day or something like that, I apologize. Um, but the terminus in Robinson County is here for the ACP. The, here is going to be the terminus. And this is where Robinson County is for most of y'all. Um, this is the east coast of um, the Atlantic coast is here. This is the east coast, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Um, again, here's, here's some existing gas transmission pipelines here in Robinson County. And again, this is the proposed terminus for the ACP. As you can see, existing Piedmont natural gas pipelines, um, which basically come off the Transco, um, go right through Prospect. And this is one of the biggest communities um, that the Native Americans in this county reside. And you can also see we have other infrastructure pipe, gas pipe infrastructure that feeds most of our major, major towns like St. Paul's, Lumberton, and Pembroke. Um, so some of the key players in Robinson County's gas distribution, um, North Carolina Energy Utilities use existing nas natural gas pipelines and related infrastructure. Most use gas comes again from the Transco pipeline. Um, you have the, the Sand Hills pipeline, um, which comes off the Transco. Um, in 2001, it was stated by CPNL, Progress Energy's Carolina Electric Utility, made a long-term agreement for gas from Transco Pipeline. And now um, they've, they've also fed other gas-fired power plants from this Transco. So what Duke Energy, Duke Energy and Dominion are doing, they're trying to get an avenue to a, to a pipeline where they don't have to depend on the Transco, where they can
basically have control of their own destiny and have control of their own pipeline. Um, current infrastructure here, um, again, here at Prospect, this current infrastructure uh, is, a, is a compressor station that's already there. And this compressor station has been here um, since the early 50s and 60s. Um, what we have now is, is existing pipes that are basically sticking out of the ground um, in anticipation for um, delivery of the ACP. Um, the, the ACP would attach to these and then that would curate another streamline for the gas to go back and forth this way to Wilmington, this way to Charlotte, North Carolina, where there are both gas-fired power plants on each end, um, with one being the Smith power station and one being the Sutton steam plant. So um, proposed infrastructure, Pro prospect, the Prospect Pembroke compressor station, this thing right here is also going to get um, an MNR station. Um, in this proposal, they're planning to bring an MNR station, a metering and regulation station here to Prospect, which also emits emissions, um, just like the compressor station and what others spoke about um, previously. <clears throat> there's emissions coming from the compressor station. Now there's going to be emissions from the MNR stations in the form of blowdowns and, and things like that. Um, so this is what's coming here to prospect. Um, uh, sorry, and, and along with a uh, 350 foot tall communication tower lit and blinking at night, and this is coming to prospect. For native people, the open sky both day and night is a natural and cultural resource. The proposed tower will obstruct the open view in our community of prospect and for miles around. It is not in harmony with the natural beauty of Prospect community. <clears throat> Here you can see the high consequence area um, that will be created with the uh, introduction of this MNR station and, um, and coupling that with the compressor station. If you can see here on the left side of the road is where the MNR station will go. The right side is the compressor station. This line is the ACP and it's coming in to the community of Prospect and, and we'll be meeting there. Um, this is really relevant uh, for my family, um, especially um, because for my family, um, we're concerned about this possibility of an explosion from the new infrastructure. <clears throat> Pipelines are not immune from accidents and they are vulnerable to natural disasters that are common in the area, such as hurricanes and flooding. This area of North Carolina received a huge hurricane just two years ago in the form of Hurricane Matthew that left um, many without homes, uh, many flooded, some even lost their lives. And in 2000 in New Mexico, a pipeline explosion killed 10 people. The size and pipeline that is coming here to, to this area is, is actually the same size as that pipeline. My brother's home is on the edge, um, if you can see adjacent basically right here in this corner. My, fam my brother's home is at the edge of the blast zone. The blast zone, if you can see, is this purple area. This is just the blast zone. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, the smaller purple is the blast zone. The, actually, the bigger area is the evacuation zone. So he's on the border of both the evacuation and blast zone in this area, which is adjacent to this compressor station. Uh, like I said, pipeline incidents occur annually throughout the U.S. We've had two incidences here in Robinson County on the Piedmont Natural Gas Line since 2014. It, again, it was in St. Paul's and in St. Paul's up here and in Lumberton, North Carolina. <clears throat> so compressor stations, uh, immediate regulation stations are common sources of methane leaks. We know that and the, and the leaks um, pollute our air. <clears throat> Robinson County, especially Prospect Community, will become one of the most dangerous locations along the route of the ACP. For approximately 125 to 150 years, my family has lived on that property adjacent. My brother and his family now live on that property, and I live about two miles away. So our family is very concerned about the possibility of this explosion. <clears throat> And there, there are other approaches to infrastructure. I mean, for us, the Native American community um, view it differently than modern 
in industrial um, companies um, for the approaches to develop based on two traditions. Um, for relationship with nature, we want to preserve and restore the store nature. They want to extract it and contaminate it. Um, with relationships with the land, source of life to preserve. There's, it's a resource to maintain for material gain. Business ownership, uh, we want it to be more local and tribal. And they want it to be absent, national, international. And that's, that's one thing they're trying to do with this pipeline is take this gas to these <clears throat> exports to, to be a competitor into the world market. Um, they're competing with Russia on that on that on that platform and other relationships to climate change the great cleansing has begun how all further fossil fuel development particularly shale and methane gas they say they're denying climate change and they are promote shell and they promote shale sorry methane gas the only remaining fossil fuel where profits can be maximized by the industry and again, this is uh, just some th alternatives that Robinson County could be looking into, biomass, solar. We're big on that in this region. <clears throat> and also landfill, gas, and fuel cell. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline um, in their um, final environmental impact statement to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, <clears throat> they, uh, they, they gave some some bad information or incomplete information. There are three North Carolina tribes noted, we, we noted inaccurate and incomplete assessments in final draft statements. And we requested formal consultation with the federal regulators. Federal regulators ignored requests for consultation, asked the developer to communicate with the tribes instead. <clears throat> and then um, the final statement in 2017, it mentioned tribes by name, but did not correct inaccuracies or address all tribal concerns. Decision on the federal permit is currently pr pr pending, but decision-making documents lack tribal input. So um, FERC, you know, approved, uh, I think, this permitting process, and it's, it, it, they have, they don't have, in, 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 they have incomplete information to back their decision up. And for the impacts, for Native Americans, um, there are 30,000 Native Americans that live within one mile of this proposed route, <clears throat> uh, and uh, which is 25% of Native North Carolina Native population. So that's 25% of our Native population in North Carolina being affected by this route. Um, that's 13%, um, for, and it's 1.2% of, of the North Carolina population and 13% make up the total population of, of the people affected. Um, some of the tribes along this route that are affected are the Lumbee, the Kohari, so Halawasaponi, and the Maharan. Federal regulators ignored corrections to flawed analysis and denied, and denied that Americans, Amer Native Americans are disproportionately impacted by the route. Instead, federal regulators concluded that poor and minority populations would not be disproportionately affected. That's a, a lot of people affected along this route right here. <clears throat> so um, some of the um, organizations that we've worked with in the past have, have like been the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, where they, in their own book or own proceedings, give us as an example of, of, of being discriminated against by the US government. Uh, it talks about us getting um, recognition in, in 1985, but then getting federal recognition in 1956 with special benefits. <clears throat> and so the advisory council say that while a statutory requirement exists to include Indian tribes and NHOs in section 106 consultations, federal agencies should remember that non-federally recognized tribes can and often should be involved. Their contributions to the process can include a deep knowledge of the history and resources in their homelands. And they give us the Lumbee of North Carolina. Um, we have occupied their this pre present day homeland for generations. <clears throat> and there's other, um, other books, other uh, reports that talk about the flawed environmental justice analysis. 
by Dr. Emanuel. <clears throat> um, and then there's our native communities being overlooked in the ACP process, and then only the defense against the environmental policy. Um, with that environmental policy and the attack on it, um, we're gonna see greenhouse gas emissions heat up our atmosphere in the next um, 30 years or 40 years. Um, we're here right now, and in the 2060, we're gonna be 10, six degrees warmer on an average July. So it's gonna get hotter <laughs> with these greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from these leaking pipes, that are coming from these compressor stations, that are coming from metering and regulation stations. More infrastructure means more leaks. Um, and 3%, um, if they leak 3%, then it's heating up our atmosphere and they're leaking more than 3%. Um, the stakes are high for Robinson County. Um, this is an image that shows future gross domestic product um, for the 2100 um, year mark. <laughs> so it's a little bit off, but, but still it shows that 11% of our total county GDP will be lost in the year 2100 due to the rising temperatures, meaning our crops won't be able to grow. Our water is gonna basically evaporate and we won't have access to that. And that's what this slide shows is that we're already competing for water sources here. Um, with the Hurricane Matthew, it came into North Carolina and Robinson County was flooded. We had a lot of sedimentation that came out of that storm. <clears throat> the same sedimentation, um, our rivers were um, polluted by, that same sedimentation is gonna come from construction of Atlantic Coast Pipeline. If this Hurricane Matthew would have hit when these guys had opened up these holes into the ground and scarred uh, Mother Earth, there would have been way more sedimentation along the banks of the rocks of the Lumber, Lumber River and other rivers leading to the Atlantic coast. And so there would have been more sedimentation going into the coast and affecting marine life. Um, for American Indian health outcome disparities, um, some of the racial disparities, we have higher infant mortalities, our life expectancy is lower, um, we have decreased access to health services. Some critical data, American Indian mean average age in younger is younger than the major majority population. We have higher morbid, morbid, morbidity of diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and arthritis. And some of the social determinants, 22% live below the poverty line. Um, and I'll show you um, a demographic of that. Um, the, the, the path that this pipeline takes goes into areas of low income families, high minority populations, and, um, and for American Indians, we have 58% um, have had high school education or less and 7.8% are unemployed. <clears throat> Leading causes of death for us are cancer. And, and with emissions, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get cancerous types emissions. So that's a big thing that's affecting us now. Our heart disease is affecting us along with chronic lung disease. Again, um, we're breathing in these carcinogenics, it's causing cancer or it's causing lungs and and asthma with our children. <clears throat> and again, this is the ACP proposed route. Um, and along this route, as I showed earlier, um, let me go back right here, the Meharan, the Halawasa Pony, the Kohari, and the Lumbee. Also Tuscarora in this nation, or uh, in this area is affected um, by this route. And here is a, it shows the, the rural counties. And, this is kind of a regional city of Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And, and this is why this is blue, but everything else is green. It's very rural. It's affecting people's farmlands. It's taking people's crops, uh, land that their family have been growing crops on for centuries. They, it, this, this is going straight through their land. Um, and local disparities, again, are increasing infant mortality, decreased life expectancy, and decreased access to services. So they're bringing all this pollution in, but they're not trying to, to give us anything to combat it. As I said, um, there are basically five tribes that are affected, um, the Halawasa Pony, the Meharan, the Kohari Lumbee, and the Tuscarora. 
and for sovereignty of our indigenous peoples. Since the time that human beings offered thanks for the first sunrise, sovereignty has been an integral part of indigenous people's daily existence. Our sovereignty leads to self-governance and requires no less. And this is a picture of um, some of our local tribe members at a um, powwow, a festival, um, celebrating um, either spring or fall um, ceremonies, um, thanking, thanking the creator for all that he's given us. <clears throat> So for conclusions, um, federal regulators omitted tribal perspectives from decision-making by ignoring disproportionate impacts and requests for consultation. Developers do not give a complete picture of the project impacts. Um, and, and speaking on that, they, they're telling us um, that they want this, to, this gas to help them fire, keep their gas-fired power plants operational. Um, that's not true. Um, we know that this is a competition to get world dominance in the natural gas realm. Um, we've we've got Senator Burr on record. Um, he's a North Carolina senator saying um, they're trying to compete with the Russians in 2015. We've got recent legislators in South Carolina talking about, you tell us which direction we go. We may go leading to Georgia to another export. So that's, that's some of the things that these corporations aren't telling. And for the Lumbee, um, one of the things is they've got a Piedmont natural gas, which they can tie to. And this Piedmont natural gas pipeline has already added another pipeline because it's an existing pipeline. And the ACP excluded that out of their application. So they wouldn't have to um, um, do anything uh, mitigation for crossing the Lumber River. Right now, it comes short of crossing the Lumber River, but it crosses a lot of its tributaries. And like I said earlier with the Hurricane Matthew, if we've had that kind of an event when operations were happening, a lot of sedimentation would have would have gotten to our waterways. So here in Robinson County at Prospect, at the, the current site, we are already seeing that our air has been affected, our water has been affected, um, someone spoke about noise. This 1400 PSI pipeline that is pushing gas through it is a, has a hissing sound. You can, I can hear the hiss from my brother's doorsteps of this gas just being pushed through this pipeline. And that causes anxiety around the communities. Um, so, um, so tribal members do not feel secure in their persons and property as the as they are intimidating, threatened with eminent domain in regard to their land. Community, family, and individual health depends on maintaining strong connections to healthful and intactful ancestral lands and environment. Conversations with corporations do not equate with consultations. Government to government consultation is required. In the case of the ACP, that would mean consultation between FERC and the Lumbee Tribal Council. The UN Tribunal, these are some recommendations, um, should draft resolutions calling on the US federal and state regulators to, not, to deny all permits until impacts on the Lumbee and other tribes have been fully assessed through accurate analysis and meaningful government to government consultation. Help the US to create a tribal climate resilience plan to prepare for economic health and other impacts of hotter summers. Increased drought and damaging floods. The UN should also request the US government to work with tribes like the Lumbee to help create a sustainable economic development plan in partnership with local governments. There's other alternatives. We could be doing a lot more with that. <clears throat> um, so next, <clears throat> as I said, tribal consultation, give tribes seats at decision-making tables. Ask regulators to comply fully with consultation recommendations of the federal government, of the state government, of international bodies, UN Declaration of Rights, of indigenous peoples. We need cultural impact studies. I was just out at a site just last week and we were um, digging and we found artifacts, um, arrowheads, um, other tools, pottery. 
<clears throat> of ancient peoples that have been around the Lumber River, the Lumbee River of North Carolina. So there's still remnants of our ancestors just lying around, lying about. And these people are coming in, <clears throat> cutting through our trees, cutting through our land, haven't did any type of cultural impact study, haven't did any archeological, meaningful archeological studies to determine if any of our lands are impacted culturally. So um, I'd like to give special thanks for some of the local Lumbee members who shared their stories and valuable information. Um, and those are Dr. Marianne Jacobs, Mr. Herbert Eddie Moore, Dr. Ryan Emanuel, Dr. Cherry Beasley, and Miss Donna Chavez. All right, so um, if anybody has any questions, um, you can ask um, about that. And I just like to point out that <clears throat> the current we infrastructure is there. Oh, we got one more. Yeah, we have we have um, our our judge Adrian Hollis is waiting. Oh, okay. That was right. great. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Adrian Hollis, and I'm served as judge at the um, People's Tribunal in Charlottesville on October 29th. Today you've heard only a small portion of the impactful testimony shared with the impartial three judge panel. That tribunal lasted almost 12 hours. And what is really important to know is that the majority of participants and attendees stayed the entire day, which underlines as nothing else would the importance of the tribunal and the seriousness of the issues. These heartfelt and sometimes shocking and gut-wrenching testimonies led the judge to develop the following conclusions and recommendations. Whereas indigenous peoples, people of color, descendants of freedmen communities, Appalachian communities, and vulnerable populations have been blatantly targeted and will most certainly be, and in some cases already are, negatively impacted by the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and Mountain Valley Pipeline as evidenced throughout the tribunal testimonies. And whereas numerous and diverse examples of cultural attachment and historic preservation atrocities exist, violations of religious and cultural practices and beliefs exist, and capricious use of eminent domain to deprive people of property and heritage, including such activities as destruction of historical records and intimidation tactics, and whereas there was a consistent and pervasive lack of public participation, lack of opportunities for public input and access to information, such as the denial of access to the wireless tower planned by the pipeline and the denial of consultancy status to Preservation Virginia under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and whereas there are numerous threats to the built environment, including places of faith, roads, highways, driveways, and homes, many of which are located within the blast zone and have existed for generations. And whereas water is put at grave risk because of the continuous crisscrossing of the proposed pipelines through rivers, streams, groundwater, and wetlands, and that under current regulations, pipes in rural areas are dramatically thinner, putting our water at tremendous risk. And whereas many witnesses have testified to the release of greenhouse gases from pipelines and compressor stations, adding to climate change and therefore harming the environment and adding to the burden both locally and globally. And whereas all of these insults negatively impact the health of humans and all living things, especially the most vulnerable, women of childbearing age, pregnant women, children, the elderly and the infirm, this tribunal strongly recommends that the state of West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina, along with all environmental agencies, should suspend all actions, undertake necessary thorough investigations, such as environmental, cultural, and health impacts assessments with real voice and real vote from the community and immediately cease and desist imminent domain actions. In addition, we strongly recommend that the United Nations Human Rights Council should put the United States on trial for crimes against human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrienne, for staying with us. 
thank you for your incredible patience and um, understanding with the technical problems. We're so grateful to you. I'm just, I practically can't even speak. I'm so moved by your generosity and time. Thank you so very much for holding this tribunal and allowing us to testify before you.